Please, this stage is yours. Thank you very much. So, wow, that's loud. So, uh, I've been talking about uh, IoT security now uh, for about three and a half years, and so I think uh, I was expecting more of an audience after last Friday because it seems like people finally care about it after three and, you know, three and a half years of not really caring about it much. Um, let's see if we can get, get some attention. Um, so the first problem that I've come across is that a lot of ordinary people just don't think it matters. They're like, what? I don't care if someone finds out my Fitbit data. I don't care if they attack my fridge. You know, it doesn't matter to me. Um, this was in 2011. Uh, it turned out you could identify users on Fitbit based on their sexual activity, um, including how long they were at it um, and various things like that. So, you know, light effort, kissing, hugging for 10 minutes. You know, it's, it's quite revealing information, which perhaps you wouldn't want uh, broadcast to the internet. So even, even with something as simple as Fitbit and, and data you think is not very confidential, it has some potential meaning because it's so personal. Um, this is a much worse example where a, a researcher found they could identify vulnerable smart homes by Googling. They found 70 just by, by typing in a Google search. They then uh, found 35 of those 70 where they could actually figure out which house it was. Uh, the location of the house and therefore the owners, they started phoning those people up and talking to them. And while they were on the phone, switching the lights on and off in the room the person was in, uh, which I think we've, we've maybe seen the Big Bang episode where that happens, but it was much more scary in real life. Um, the Ford Cherokee sorry, the Jeep Cherokee, uh, was famously remotely braked, so they could control your car while you're in it, having never touched it, only through a remote hack in 2014. Uh, so what happened was Jeep had to recall every single car and fix them, and they just finished doing that when the same researchers did it again uh, and managed to hack the updated version of the firmware remotely again. Uh, this year, some Chinese researchers managed to do a Tesla. Uh, but even something as innocuous as the tire pressure monitoring system uh, on a car uh, has a 40-meter range. So you can actually fingerprint cars as they drive past based on their tire pressure monitoring system. And, and worse, you can drive along beside it and make the driver think that they have a flat tire and they pull over and then you can attack them. So it's a very simple hack on something as simple as the tire pressure monitoring system. Uh, so these vulnerabilities are embedded right in the details of these systems. Uh, this is even more scary. Uh, a researcher called Robert sat in the back of a, of a 777. He plugged an ethernet cable into the in-flight entertainment system and he actually changed the thrust, the velocity, and the direction of the plane by hacking into the avionics system. So what happened was in the old uh, 767s, they had something called an ARINC 429 bus because they want the avionics to, to send information to the in-flight entertainment to say where we are and produce that beautiful little map. Uh, and uh, they upgraded to the latest version, the ARINC 629 and the 777, and it turns out that's a two-way bus and gave the in-flight entertainment system access to the avionics network, which is, uh, frankly, the most scaring, scary thing I've seen. Because, you know, if, if ISIS, for example, knew how to do this, you'd be sure that they would be crashing planes. Um, so uh, it's normally a rule, they say, you know, when you're, when you're presenting to an audience, don't insult them. Uh, so I apologize for number one on here. My first rule of IoT security is don't be stupid. And I don't mean you, but I do mean all the vendors who are doing these kind of things. And uh, the second rule is be smart. And the third rule is think about what's different. So I think the very first basic thing is not to do the sort of same mistakes that have already been done on the web, already been done in, in many internet cases. The second one is to use the best available web technology to, to so resolve security issues, which I think people aren't doing. And then, then you, and then once you've done all that, that's just the starting point, because now you have to think about the hardware, the physical aspect of cyber-physical systems. So just to 
uh, ram home the don't be stupid. This was a internet connected fridge. Uh, a security researcher found that it was spa sending out spam email because it had a Linux system inside it. The Linux system had an SMTP server on, running on it, a mail server, unprotected on port 25, and so it was just taken up and sending spam on behalf of the, the user for, for, some, for some part of some botnet. Um, so that's the kind of just simply don't, you know, don't do obvious things like leave open SMTP servers on your, on your IoT device. Um, this is a bit of the MS Blaster worm from 2003, uh, which was one of the first sort of uh, systems where, where they mass attacked systems. And, and you can see in the code it actually said, Billy Gates, why do you make this possible? Stop making money and fix your software. It uh, was embedded into the source code of the, of, the, of the worm. And of course, we all know what happened last Friday when uh, the Mirai attack happened. It was actually the second DDoS attack using IoT devices. And what really scares me is it takes an average of five minutes from plugging in your IoT device, your unprotected IoT device, to it being scanned by a botnet and, and, in, and turned into part of that botnet. That's, that's a really, really amazing number, isn't it? You've, you've, you haven't probably logged into it yourself and, and figured out how it works. You're still reading the manual, and it's already part of a botnet. Um, that was a 620 gigabits per second attack. That was only from 100,000 devices. There are estimates of how many IoT devices there are, how many connected devices. And the current estimate is, say, 10 billion devices. So this was a tiny, tiny fraction of those connected devices used in this attack. Imagine if they had a million devices. Then that would have been a, a six terabyte attack, which, which would have overwhelmed almost anything. So this is, this is really scary. So, so there's a sort of face palm thing going on here. Why are people doing this? You know, and I think there's, there's two challenges. One is the, the manufacturers are not in any way incentivized to make their system secure, especially when you think about a lot of these systems are very low price, uh, high volume, low margin, uh, created by, you know, b bunches of developers, typically in China, quite often reusing IP that they have um, perhaps got a different mindset to. So a lot of Chinese have a sort of, let's call it an internal open source strategy where they basically copy IP from other systems and then uh, put it into a chip and then there's some manual that you can get if you know the Chinese manufacturer. So they're often not the originators of the IP. So they don't, they're just reusing it as quickly as they can. Um, and what else is different? So what's, what's really unique about IT? Well, one of the biggest problems we know is updates. So those smart homes that got hacked, there was an update that fixed it, but it hadn't been installed in those houses. Even worse, Checkpoint Firewall did a study where they found a, a man, bit of management firmware that was embedded in a million devices. And the bug in it, the vulnerability they found, had been fixed three years before and brand new devices were still being shipped with out-of-date firmware. So the manufacturers are not updating the firmware, uh, even with the latest version from their, from their OEM suppliers. So, so that's a real challenge. They basically, Checkpoint, found a million uh, IoT devices that they could remotely hack. So, so that just puts the, and that was about two years ago, so, so that puts Mirai into perspective. Uh, the, 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 the margin and the, the size of these devices often prohibit crypto. Uh, that isn't, it doesn't stop crypto. There are p plenty of people who've proven you can do crypto on a 32K bit, 32K flash, 8-bit device, but nobody's, nobody's bothering. It's just too complex to squeeze it down. It takes too much hand coding and hand optimization. Um, you know, the fact there is a device basically means people have to come up with new ways of security and association. So how do you take ownership of a device securely? How do you do that? So that's what a lot of my research is about, is how to come up with models that support crypto, that support 
security, secure device identifiers and secure registration, even on an IoT device. Of course, the data is personal, but the biggest problem is, what I was saying is that appliance manufacturers don't think like security experts. And they also don't think like providers. Building stuff is easier than running stuff. Software, people who've built long-term enterprise software systems know the hard part is maintaining it, providing the patches, providing the security releases. These guys are used to chucking a product out there and moving on to the next thing. So that's a big challenge. And we saw that with mobile phones, didn't we? We, we saw it where we as software techies expected our mobile phones to be updated and the mobile phone device manufacturers weren't doing that. And they've, they've upped their game a bit. So I, I've written a, a long paper on this uh, where I go into those challenges in a lot more technical uh, and academic rigor. Uh, I'm not going to go into that now, but if you want to, to read it, uh, it's available. The, the, it's in a book uh, called Engineering the Secure Internet of Things, uh, but yeah, the book is frightfully expensive, but there's a free version on that URL, so that'll help you out. Um, just to give you some idea of hardware attacks, so... If, if, you, if you come from London or you've been to London, you'll recognize this. This is the travel card used by, by London Transport. You, you charge it up and you, pay, you use it to, to pay for fares. Uh, this was uh, famously hacked by a guy called Robert Garcia, who was at a university in the Netherlands. Uh, one of the things was the, the guys who built this, my fare, wrote their own encryption algorithm. They wrote their own security protocols. They built it all from scratch. And I guess maybe they thought, because it's in hardware, no one's going to know what's going on. Perhaps they didn't expect uh, Roberto Garcia to put this under a scanning electron microscope, reverse engineer the algorithm, find a hole in the algorithm, and then basically be able to, to break it. Um, you can actually still do this today because the old cards, the, there are newer cards that are now secure, but the old cards are still accepted on London Underground. You can still do it. Slightly more worrying, these devices were um, being used as door entry for every nuclear power station and every military base in the Netherlands. And so the day after he announced this hack, there were armed guards everywhere who'd been called out to protect every doorway because they were paranoid about it. Um, and and uh, Tony was talking earlier about, you know, whether there's bug bounties from companies. Uh, there was no bounty for doing this. They took him to court and tried to stop him publishing his paper uh, when he gave them advance warning of it and, and tried to do the proper security no notification proposal. And they basically tried to suppress it and stop him publishing, uh, which, which failed. If you don't have a scanning electron microscope yourself, of course, there's companies like this who will do this for you. You can pay companies to take hardware and put it under a scanning electron microscope and, and reverse engineer it on your behalf. Um, or if you fancy trying something at home, here's a, a website I found that basically shows how to reset the lock bit on an AVR chip. An AVR chip is the most commonly used 8-bit microcontroller, and the lock bit stops you reading the code on it. You do this, and then you can get the code off of it. Um, or there's a long technical report from Cambridge University about how to do it. This guy's quite famous. You will remember the FBI uh, recently told Apple that they needed a backdoor into Apple phones because they couldn't read the data off it. This guy uh, managed to break into an iPhone in about 40 hours by using a standard piece of hardware. He says it's not that difficult. And, and they, you know, supposedly the FBI paid a million dollars to some Israeli company. He reckons they were ripped off for about 990,000 of that. Um, so, so there's lots of ways of attacking hardware. Uh, and then there's another challenge, which I think is going to become even more important, which is de-anonymization. These guys, so Netflix did something called the Netflix Prize, and they made available the viewing figures from about half a million Netflix users, and they anonymized them, and they, they ran a competition to see if you could come up with a better recommendation system. These guys had this thought. They sat there, and they thought, well... I wonder if people who rent Netflix videos then score them on IMDb 
within, say, two hours of having watched the video? Yeah, I bet they might do. So they managed to de-anonymize about 35% of this data set uh, within a couple of hours by comparing it to IMDb ratings. So this is a real challenge, which is that as soon as you start uh, getting data, even if the IoT device is secure, it may, you might start publishing data, and people can then sync that data up with other large data sets and find out stuff about you that maybe you didn't want finding out. Um, just to make it clear, the NSA does this today. This is one of Snowden's revelations. They have uh, 700 servers around the world, and if they have an interest in you uh, today, they type in your email address or your phone number or some other identifier for you, and these servers basically de-anonymize your uh, IP traffic, your web traffic, your SMS texts, your phone call metadata, uh, your emails, and, and everything else that they can find about you and give, them the, give the analyst a 24-hour history of the last 24 hours of your electronic lifetime uh, with everything. So this kind of de-anonymization is in progress and, and happens today. Um, we had the, the Britain's top police officer complaining last year. He said, he said, you know, when you phone for the police, we don't know where you are, but Uber does. Uh, it turns out that Uber not only did, but they built this internal website called the God View. That's, you can see it up in the corner there. That's what they actually called it. And any employee could track any Uber user. Not just which taxis you took, but where you were any time of day or night, because your phone was pinging back to them. And surprise, surprise, the employees were not using this for good purposes. They were stalking their, their ex-girlfriends, their wives, their husbands. Uh, they were basically, and, and potential girlfriends and boyfriends as well, they were basically misusing this massively. Um, one of the big problems with IoT attacks, is, as, and I've heard this all day long, is this concept of an attack tree, that you break into something low level and you increase the attack. So Target, um, it turns out that they had unsecured energy meters in every store. Uh, they were used, they were basically hacked into, and from there, they then put a sniffer on the network and grabbed everyone's credit card data as it was going through and stole a million credit card numbers. So you might think it doesn't matter if they get information from the energy meter, but this is a clear example of how the weakest point in your network becomes the, the greatest vulnerability. And so, so we end up with these four big challenges. So we have insecure hardware, insecure software, de-anonymization, uh, and breaking promises about privacy and consent, which like, like Uber was doing. Um, and, and I'm not one of these people who's all doom and gloom. I think there are solutions, and I, I'm trying to work to create some small solutions as part of my work, but there's a lot more. Um, so reiterating what I said before, don't be stupid. So let's make sure that we use the latest, uh, the latest firmware, the latest fixes. Uh, make sure we don't ship code that has obvious holes in it. Um, for hardware, don't my first rule is don't rely on obscurity. So that's what those MyFair guys did. Uh, that's also my second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh rule. Uh, this is the most obvious thing, I think, is that people just rely on obscurity. And the sort of uh, the outcome of that is that hacking a single device should not break all of them. The Mirai is the most obvious of these, that they figured out how to hack one device, and then they instantly had 100,000 at their command. Um, so that's really obvious. But it does have a real challenge, because if you're building an IoT system, and you have a very small margin, it costs a lot more to manufacture a secure identifier into every device than it does to zap default credentials into it. So this is a real challenge because there's a cost-benefit analysis. Um, there's a lot of work on this concept of privacy by design, and this is a big part of the, the GDPR uh, regulations coming into Europe. Um, and, and so this is, I think, something that, that IoT manufacturers really need to get their head around, and I don't think they have, to be honest. Um, and there's a lot of people who still think that 
that controls like location, IP address, a network address translation, and a VPN can protect them. And they just can't. So you need to have secure identities and secure controls on systems. Uh, so I've been doing work with standards like OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect, which allow you to, for instance, use two-factor authentication to protect your IoT device. So that's a, a key aspect. And what I've been trying to do is to push the envelope on privacy. So at the moment, we have our existing systems that are basically horribly insecure. If you, you know, I've heard people talk about Google Nest. If you have a Nest in your house, it's basically telling Google everything about your home lifestyle, which rooms you're in, what temperature, you know, what, when you're asleep, when you're awake, all kinds of sensors in there. And interestingly, it has, it has something that's really good for security, which is remote update. So that's great for security, but remote update is really bad for privacy because it means that manufacturers can add new ways of infringing your privacy into your environment without you knowing about it. You don't know when the Nest is updated. If they find some way of using that to, to find out more information about you, they can do that without your controls. So I'm interested in pushing the boundaries to extreme privacy. And the reason why is because I think probably there's a happy medium somewhere in the middle here. Right? Somewhere in the middle, you want to have, uh, you want to share some of your data. It's not an IoT environment, really, if you're never sharing anything. People do want to share their data. They do have an interest in saying, OK, I want to give some of my health data to a health analysis system in the web where I can get hints on how to improve my diet. That's good. But I think the wrong way is to try and bolt that on from where we are today. I think the right way is to build highly secure private systems and then allow users and, and developers and systems to add clearly defined what data is going to be shared from them. So I think that's the only way of really achieving privacy and security in the IoT. And I don't know why that's blank. Oh, I pressed the wrong button. So I, I've built this system called Othing. And I warn you, this is not a secure system. So this is a prototype. You can hack in. You can break it. There's all sorts of things wrong with it. But what it's trying to do is to demonstrate a new model of sharing of, of identity and data that tries to protect against some of those controls, that tries to be at that far end of the system. And it's basically got some key features. So it has a secure device identity, uh, which, is, which is embedded into the system during manufacture in a, in a reasonable way. It has a secure ownership model where you take ownership of the device through some secure, secure model, and you have to log in possibly with, with some uh, with some two-factor authentication to do that. It doesn't provide, doesn't use port forwarding. So it, it doesn't allow some of those UPnP type attacks. Uh, really interestingly, it uses pure anonymous identities and anonymous sharing of data. So you can share data without giving away who you are. Of course, you may leak that information. You may say, I share my data onto my Facebook page. Then you've, you've given it away. But if you choose to, you can be and uh, it has this concept of a personal cloud middleware. How am I doing for time? I don't have a watch on. Uh, well, one minute officially, but we started five minutes later. So OK. We have five minutes. All right. Well, I'm, I have a two-minute video, so I think we'll get away with that if we can. Ah, brilliant. Thank you. So this, this video is very straightforward. Basically, what happens is I, I have a Tupperware box. This is a sort of a traditional thing if you're not a hardware manufacturer. And the first step is basically that I try and register this device securely with something called the device identity provider. Um, and so uh, the, here's my Tupperware box. I switch it on. This is, happens in the factory. So this is a secure environment where it's uh, just connecting to the local network. Uh, and saying I exist, and this little Raspberry Pi sees it, and gosh, prints out a QR code. So this is meant to be a very cheap, simple, effective way of doing device res registration. The authorization process is slightly more complex. It's uh, basically a modified OAuth 2 flow. I'm not going to go into details, but the idea here is that, that probably that QR code would be covered up with a sticker while it's in the shop. But when you take ownership of this device, you un 
cover the sticker, you switch the device on, and then you take a picture of that QR code, and now you use your existing identities. So in my case, I'm going to use my GitHub login, but you use your Facebook, Twitter, Google login to now take ownership of that device. And what that's doing is creating a secure token, uh, but it doesn't identify you, it identifies an anonymous pseudonym for you. So you are not inherently sharing your identity. So there's a, a, it looked like I was logging in, but I wasn't logging into the device, I was only logging into the device identity provider. And now I need to share data, so I go to a site I want to share data to, and this again looks like I'm logging into that site with my GitHub credentials, but in fact, these are not shared with the, th with the third party site. Uh, I now get to approve if I want to share data, so there's always full consent of sharing. And now I can switch on the LED and switch off the LED remotely, but neither the device nor the third party website know who I am. So this is a, just a simple example of trying to um, control the information that's shared. So I think identity is one of the things that is typically shared a lot, but we don't, the device manufacturers don't worry about that. They don't think about that. And I think that you shouldn't even share your identity. And so what I said about this, now, you know, when I talk to device manufacturers about this, uh, I was talking to a large car manufacturer last week, and, and they were frankly, no, Paul, we don't want this. We want the data from the car. I've heard that they actually have humidity sensors in the, the high-end cars, and th they, they said that they can actually tell if it's a man or a woman sitting in the car seat. And they can tell if the woman is pregnant from the sensors in the car. And they want this data so they can use it. Now, personally, I think that's wrong, but if that's their business model, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to change it. But I still think that even if you take that business model where you're going to get people's data, there are some key things you could do. So you can make sure that you have full consent to receive that data and act on the user's behalf. Uh, you can do those secure device IDs and federated identity and anonymous identities. When that Tupperware box launches, it creates a secure device shadow in the cloud which hides things like your IP address, which reduces fingerprinting. And in particular, it can do summarization and filtering of data, so you don't publish everything. Because, for example, if your phone has an accelerometer in it, that accelerometer has a unique signature, a unique fingerprint that can be used to track you. So this kind of technology can protect against that. So that's really what I'm trying to do, but I, I hope you go away with a message, one message in particular which is that the only way we can fix the IoT mess we're in is by working together to come up with the best practices. And, and the best practices I have are just a very small part of that. So I think we need to, to create exemplars, and we need the, the, uh, the security industry in particular to create examples and exemplars of best practice and to push those out and to, to fix it as a group not just as trying to fix our own thing, but as an industry to sort this mess out, because otherwise we're in deep trouble. All right, thank you very much, appreciate that. Paul, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, here's the uh, nice much. little gift and uh, certificate of appreciation that you were able to join oh. us today. Thank and, you so and, much. And, uh, well, uh, I, I, uh, I will, I will, and I think, I hope I will see you in the panel uh, later on in the afternoon. But here's my, my, my very quick one. Now, IoT, the purpose of the IoT actually is that everything talks to everything and eases up our, our, our living. On the other hand, we don't want, we want it to be secure. We don't want to, you know, to give away any of our data. Da, 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 da. Then you mentioned car manufacturers who want this data and da, 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 da. Now, do, do you believe it's, it's actually doable? Because currently every producer is doing something on his own. There are no standards. It's, it's a mess. So I have seen some very good systems 
that take together, for example, multiple uh, smart home features and unify them, even if the manufacturers didn't know about it. So, for example, there's a very good EU-funded project called Mesh, M-E-S-C-H, mm -hmm. that has done this. And uh, they add in extra security by, by taking over the way it's done and replacing the, the bad security of the manufacturer with their own model. So I think there are some approaches to make this happen correctly. Uh, every, single security, every single new wave of computing always has security problems. So for example, you know, I remember client-server computing coming in. I did an early project in 1987 where I built an early client-server. And every, if you go and read the blogs and the, the papers at the time, people are saying, this can't be secure, it's going to be a mess. Uh, cloud computing is a great example. In s many cases, the, the systems people are building today in the cloud are actually more secure than the systems they were building five years ago in their on-premise system because the cloud manufacturers are so paranoid and have had to really prove that they can do security. So I think it's possible. I think the big problem in IoT is the economics, is that if you uh, just, just take Kickstarter, you go on Kickstarter and there's a cool new IoT project, and then if it's doing well on Kickstarter, two weeks later, there's another project from a Chinese team that looks remarkably similar and is about two-thirds the price, right? And th you can bet those guys who are, who are replicating this as fast as they possibly can don't care at all about security. They want to sell, you know, 100,000 on Kickstarter and then move on. So that's the pro problem is the economics of IoT need to somehow be changed to encourage security. Okay, good one. We have to trust the, the, the developers of such things. Now, okay, you are, of course, welcome to publish uh, the work on GitHub, so young developers, uh, startups, etc. It's could actually already there. Learn. It's yeah. already on GitHub. So they could learn that. Okay, thank you. Uh, a nice applause to Paul. Uh, you have a question? Okay, I, I need to bring you the microphone. So uh, since we are recording and streaming our session, we need people to, you know, to hear your question, actually. One second, I will be right here. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my question is uh, actually, why do you think, um, uh, knowing that uh, women is pregnant in the car and, you know, adjusting and tailoring the temperature for her is bad? And why it's wrong? Because, like, you know, giving we are giving our information on Facebook, Twitter, and actually, at the end of the day, well, nobody cares about us. It's just that they can tailor the services they provide, and that's good for me. I really like when you know providers tailor the services. So, what what is the danger? Because the, here? the car company I heard about was talking about selling your data, the fact you're pregnant, to the insurance company. Now, you might not want that. It really should be your choice to tell the insurance company that you're pregnant, I believe. Uh, also, you might not have told your boyfriend. Your so, so there's a real story, right, of a Target, the, the same large retailer in the US, uh, sent a, some advertising for nappies to a 17-year-old girl. And uh, the father phoned up the store, very cross, saying, you're persuading my daughter that it's okay to get pregnant. And uh, the manager phoned back two weeks later to apologize, and the father said, well, actually, she is pregnant, and I didn't know. Uh, and somehow, targets had analyzed her, her buying patterns and had, had found out she was pregnant and was were advertising her. Now, that if the father had that's the way he found out that she was pregnant, which it wasn't because he didn't believe it. But if it was, that might have caused her significant problems at home. You know, she might have been waiting for the right time to tell, tell her family that she was pregnant. So I think, I think there, is a, there needs to be explicit consent. And I bet you, somewhere in that car's manual, it says, you consent to give us this data. It doesn't say... Uh, you can. We know if you're pregnant, and we're going to find that out. And you, are you willing to share that? So, uh, just to tell you what happens with Target, one last thing. Now, they they're they're just more sneaky. So they put an advert for the nappies next to an advert for a lawnmower, and they send it to the people they think are pregnant. 
and, the re and the, they know that, pregnant, that, that the people will look at this and think, oh, it's random. It's just a random set of stuff that they have on special offer. It's not. They're deliberately anti-targeting you at the same time so that you don't realize you're targeted, which I think is really creepy. I'm, I think that's the, the, the sort of psychology of, of hiding the fact they're targeting from you is, is quite unpleasant, but there we go. Yeah, definitely. We but, have the right to know anyway. Yeah. But if they right. use the data correctly and with the right consent, then of course, that's what I'm trying to enable. That's what I believe the IoT is about, is using data in the right way with the right consent. It's just when they, when they do it without you knowing that I think it's unpleasant. Yeah. Thank you very okay. much. A great okay. question. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, a nice applause.